Thank you. I think I'm going to navigate my own slides from here. It's actually a tough act to follow up the Roger Packer, to be honest with you, he's a giant in the field of neurology. Uh, what I'm going to focus today is epilepsy, genetics, and uh, precision therapies. Um, so uh, my talk will consist of a few different areas, which includes what actually epilepsy is, um, what's epilepsy genetics com contributing to the management of epilepsy, and precision therapies in epilepsy. And I have no disclosures, but I have, do have disclaimers that I'm a clinical neurologist with interest and expertise in pediatric epilepsy. I'm not a geneticist, so anybody who wants to add anything to what I say, it's more than welcome. To start off with, uh, we need to understand what's the reality of living with epilepsy. I need to go back to the year 2004 when I saw this patient who was eight years old at that time with drug-resistant epilepsy. And she had gone to many, many centers all over the world. Uh, parents were quite resourceful and they were traveling around to find answers for the kids. Uh, they saw me at Wild Cornell and in the clinic in a routine Tuesday clinic afternoon. And they asked the questions all the parents want to know the, this answer. What's the cause of my child's condition? Can you fix it? And what's the future? And 2004, uh, my face went completely blank, obviously, because I couldn't answer any of those questions. Um, if you move on to year 2022, I think expectations from all the families are the same, but I think we have a little bit of better answers. Now, People with epilepsy uh, live with fear for another seizure. Our parents are worried, when is the next seizure? They have problems with toxicity of drug. It's a life limiting disease. There's stigma, loss of confidence, family concern, medical problem, physical problem. So it truly is a life altering disease. So I will take maybe one or two slides to get up to speed to what actually epilepsy is. It's not one disorder. It's a group of disorders and many of them are rare conditions. It's a group of neurobiological disorder that is caused by neuronal hyper excitability and hypersynchrony. There's uh, basically an imbalance between excitation and inhibition. One in 30 individuals in their lifetime will develop epilepsy. That's a huge number. Uh, more than 65 million people in the world uh, suffer from epilepsy and more than 50% of them are children. Seizure is not the only symptom of this disease. It has other comorbidity, comorbidities such as um, uh, intellectual delays, motor delays, cognitive regression, and it has some other very interesting phenomena. One of them is called sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. A vast majority of epilepsies a few years ago used to be thought of acquired. Now we know that genetics play a far more important role, and we suspect that more than 70% of epilepsies have a genetic basis. We classify epilepsies based into two groups, generalized epilepsies, focal epilepsies. We can also classify epilepsies on the basis of syndromic classification, and we, where we use a cluster of clinical features, EEG patterns, uh, natural history of the disease and prognosis, and, and in some cases now, the actual genetic diagnosis. We have a variety of benign epilepsy syndromes, such as Rolandic epilepsy, childhood absence epilepsy, and so on and so forth. But the major burden of disease is the catastrophic epilepsies that fill our clinics on a day-to-day -day basis. This include Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, infantile spasm, some genetic syndromes such as Dravet syndrome. They are now collectively called as developmental and epileptic and cephalopathies. They typically have their onset before three years of life, and they are largely due to de novo genetic mutations, and almost all of them are therapy resistant. On the right side, take my word for it, this EEG shows a very disorganized pattern. It's called hypsarrhythmia, which simply means chaos. In most of the patients with these developmental and cephalopathies that have genetic origin, the, the brains look really bad. So one of the concepts that has emerged is that if you fix the underlying etiology, you may be able to reverse this burden of disease and maybe normalize not only the seizures, but improve the EG so that the cognition can improve. Now, how do we treat epilepsy? We typically use a phenotypic framework. Okay, We classify patients into different types of seizures, epilepsy syndromes, we investigate them. But at the end of the day, we most of the time end up using a drug. And uh, we have more than 28 anti-seizure medications, and it's quite disappointing to, for me to stand here and say that in only 70% of patients, we get some good results, but one third of patients still suffer from drug-resistant epilepsy. So we are not doing so good there. 
We have other treatments that can be offered to some patients such as resective surgery, uh, temporal lobectomy. We have neurostimulations of various kinds, vagus nerve stimulation is here. And for some people, diet may be a very good option. And I would tell you that diet is a very underutilized option. Now, as I said to you, there are many, many drugs. The drug development program in, in the USA uh, started back in the 1930s, and it's really an amazing program where they led to the development of almost 40 drugs. And this was based on a phenotyping approach to treat. As I said, 70% of patients have very good outcomes with these drugs, and they are the first choice. But why 30% of patients remain refractory? There may be some flaws in the way we have treated epilepsy for many, many decades. And um, one of the things that I think uh, and my literature review suggests that most acute seizure models that were used to develop these drugs actually do not mimic spontaneous human epilepsy. Uh, we actually do not address the biological cause of the disease. So there are some new medications, cannabidiol you might have heard of, uh, fenfluramine and steripentrol. These are a little bit different from the old med medications, which were basically uh, channel altering drugs that these three new compounds have been tried specifically in patients with Dravet syndrome and have found to be benefits. So they are not really precision therapies, but you can pretty much say that they are better choices than what we used to have. So beginning in 2012, we started to use next generation sequencing platform in our clinics and that completely changed our approach to understanding epilepsies and treating epilepsies. On the left side is a conventional view of how we used to look at etiology of epilepsy. Johnny hit his head and developed seizure. That was it, you know, nobody ever thought of genetic contribution of epilepsy. But by about 2014, the pie on the right side tells you that more than 70% of epilepsies are genetic in nature. They are not idiopathic. I used to say, if you call some idiopathic, that means the patient is pathetic and the doctor is stupid. And this turns out to be true, that we actually don't look for etiology. It is always there to be found. So we just need to do a little bit of harder work. So discovery and identification of new etiologies are paving the way for novel treatments, and we call them precision medicine. Okay, this concept of genetic etiology is not uh, new. It's old. Lennox, who is considered to be the father of epileptology in the US, was the first one to identify uh, high incidence of um, genetic, uh, high incidence of epilepsy in monozygotic twins compared to the dizygotic twins. And these are his famous twins of Catherine and uh, Constance, who look alike. Their EEGs are very similar. They have this classic three hertz spike and wave, wave pattern. And they started their epilepsy within days of each other, literally days of each other. You know, they're twins, remember, and they're monozygotic twins. And now, uh, ethosuximide. Uh, this drug has been announced in 1960s, and I believe that this was the first precision therapeutic because uh, it is still the drug of choice for childhood absence epilepsy. Many people use Keppra, Depakine, so on and so forth, and I, I don't understand the reason why. We have a precision therapy for this very common childhood epilepsy, and the reason is it uh, uh, um, affects the underlying biological mechanism. Ethosuximide blocks the calcium channel identified in some of these childhood epilepsy families. So this is a perfect example of a precision medicine, though it has existed with us since the 1960s. Now, the further contribution to genetics was done by other investigators all around the world, Australian groups, Japanese groups. They all pointed to the fact that genes play an important role in epilepsy. Now, the first actual gene for epilepsy was the um, nicotine acetylcholine receptor and encoding for uh, autosomal dominant uh, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. This gene took about 15 years to be discovered. So now the investigators who were doing this were amazing. They spent years and years to find the first real epilepsy gene. Then in 1997, we had the sodium channel. And by between 1999 and the year 2005, we had a lot of ion channels um, genes discovered responsible for various kinds of epilepsy. And when the next generation sequencing plate platform ca came in 2009, there was just this explosion of genetic discoveries relating to different epilepsy syndromes. Now, uh, this slide is not to just tell you how many genes are. This is actually just 
showing you some of the genes that were discovered by that time between 2015 and 2022 over a thousand genes have been discovered and this paper by Wong and colleagues did a meta analysis and they found greater than 900 epilepsy associated genes and they also found that there are 90 epilepsy specific genes so you can see that once next generation platform came into research and clinics, we, we started to discover different causes of epilepsy. So back to the clinic, uh, who should we evaluate for genetic cause of epilepsy? It's very simple. Anybody who doesn't have an etiology, as simple as that, you know, uh, developmental and epileptic encephalopathies is another group of epilepsy, drug resistant epilepsy, non-structural epilepsy. And of course, sometimes it's the desire of the families for family counseling. And most importantly, we want to improve the life of these patients who have genetic epilepsies. So we have these classical platforms. I've heard, uh, you know, all two days of talks I didn't hear anybody, I, I may be mistaken, nobody talked about karyotyping and its role in investigation of um, human diseases or neurological diseases. And I'm gonna shed light on it. It still remains, it was, I think Damon will know better, probably since 1950s or 60s, we have karyotyping, right? Uh, then we have also the conventional chromosomal microarrays that we use, but the most important test is next generation sequencing with its platform of epilepsy gene panels, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. And I can tell you, if you have to order one test, just go for the jugular, order the whole genome sequencing. Okay, so do we still need karyotyping? I think for most people, we do not um, need carry, conventional karyotyping. There is one group of disorders in which you actually need karyotyping to diagnose the condition. And the case that I saw in 2004 is this beautiful girl, Cara, who had drug resistant epilepsy. Uh, this was 2004 and uh, I, I, I was struggling to find what's her diagnosis. And I came across this paper by Sam Berkowick and colleagues in Australia, where they described a phenotype that was quite um, similar to her, that she had drug-resistant epilepsy, non-convulsive status epilepticus, and, and, he, he, and there was one word of it, R20 syndrome, non-convulsive status epileptical tonic seizures. I very reluctantly ordered a karyotype, and of course it was negative. And most of the people uh, guessed in this room that um, that was the wrong test, actually. Uh, what I should have done is I should have ordered karyotype with mosaic screening because the, these are mosaic disorders in which certain percentage of cells will have the mutant uh, problem and so uh, otherwise everything else is normal. So G-banded karyotyping is an important um, test to discover mosaic ring epilepsies. Ring epilepsies um, have high incidence of epilepsy in 20, 17, and 14. These are a group of drug-resistant epilepsies, and they can only be identified by mosaic conventional karyotyping. On the right side, you, you see this ring. So um, this is actually Cara Ford's um, uh, karyotyping, and you can see that uh, she has 60% normal, and 45% uh, abnormal. So this is called mosaicism. So if you test only five cells, you will not make this diagnosis. Okay, you will completely miss it. Now, this is actually the fish. You can see that in where she has two normal 20s, she has both probes lighting up. And here, all what has happened in this condition is that the chromosome is circularized. Both ends of the uh, chromosomes are intact. It's just nothing is missing there, except there is just fusion of the two ends of the, of the chromosome. So this is a very unique sort of situation where you cannot identify it unless you do proper mosaic screening. Okay. Now, I will skip this slide because I've already told you most of these, um, um, these are difficult epilepsies. You really have to have high index of suspicion and some experience in picking them up. They're, the EEGs may, 
could be pathognomonic, pathognomonic, but very hard to pick up. Now, um, I got involved with this foundation back in 2004 and then started to collect some patients. And this resulted in um, a collection of over 100 patients over a span of five, six years. And we clearly identified something very important in these patients. And that was that when you do mosaic screening and when you know the percentage of mosaicism they have, it really determines their prognosis. So if you have 10% rings, and 90% um, normal chromosome, you are probably normal. But if you have 40-60 ratio, you probably have the disease. And if you have all rings, then you have a severe devastating form of ring epilepsy that I'm not gonna show to you today. So these are important con contributions that just a simple old fashioned test like a karyotype will make for you. So again, to emphasize that the percent mosaicism um, correlates with the agent onset of seizures in these syndromes. Mosaicism has actually, I didn't hear the word mosaicism till I started to study these patients. Now we know that mosaicism actually plays a very important role in other genetic disorders as well. And this morning we had this discussion where we were thinking that maybe if you do blood, you will not find the genetic mutation. You probably have to other, other, study other tissues such as fibroblast or the brain to actually find the genetic mutation. So again, emphasis is that ring syndromes can are really underdiagnosed and they will not be diagnosed by chromosomal microarrays because there is no deletion, no duplication. Um, uh, whole exome se sequencing, whole genome sequencing will also not diagnose them because there is no deletion, no duplication or no sequence changes. So the only thing that will make the diagnosis is really a, a conventional karyotype with mosaic screening. Okay. Uh, a role of copy number variations. We know this chromosomal microarrays have become very important in the genetic landscape of epilepsy. Uh, its yield is about 13 to 15%. Some of the important um, hotspots are listed here um, where recurrent um, uh, copy number variations have been identified. I will not go into detail, but we do frequently do chromosomal microarrays as a first tier test in patients who we suspect have a non-structural epilepsy especially in patients who have uh, other congenital abnormalities and dysmorphic features. Here are some of the hotspots that um, have led to identification of some um, um, genes that explain why epilepsy happens. So just to show you these hotspots on some of the chromosomes, we'll move on from there. Now, next generation sequencing is widely used in epilepsy now in clinics. It has a diagnostic yield of about 50 to 60%. And why it's only 50 to 60%, and I think this may be um, what tissue you examine. If you examine vein, maybe you will find 100% of the genes. So I think this is something that we need to understand when a um, powerful test like that is negative, that it is not complete information. Okay, most people believe that next generation Sequencing is expensive and it's inaccessible and that's rubbish and not true. Next generation sequencing is a, not a, it's a clinical tool. It's, it's a research tool, but it's readily available in, in clinics. Any physician can order it, pediatricians, geneticists, neurologists. Whole exome sequencing costs about $1,500. And more recently I checked with a company in US, they can do whole genome sequencing for about $3,000. Almost the same cost as what you would do um, on other investigations uh, that we uh, do in epilepsy. Some companies even actually do it for free, such as the direct con con uh, consumer testing 23andMe, where you can spit a little bit of your DNA in a tube and send to them, and three weeks later, you get your genomic profile. So things are very changing very rapidly, and the cost of um, next generation sequencing is coming down. And we have heard a number of colleagues of mine here talking about rapid, rapid exome sequencing and so on and so forth. Okay, here's a partial list of epilepsy genes by function. This is just a reminder that our brain is a very complex organ. Many of these genes that are listed here are coding for ion channels. And ion channels have been a very hot topic uh, for target of drug development for many decades. In the clinics, pediatric neurologists and epilepsy doctors like to classify epilepsies by epilepsy syndrome. This is a complex slide. And uh, when you look at it, there's a group of uh, 
uh, if you look at the um, column where it says infantile spasm, there are about 25 genes now that are actually called infantile spasm. Uh, SCN1A Dravet syndrome, we have now seven genes that actually account for one phenotypic disease, Dravet syndrome. So these are some of the complexities that pediatric neurologists have to go through. So I try not to phenotype my patients and get an epilepsy gene panel. I'm going for a genotype classification. I'm going for next generation sequencing. And then when a gene defect is identified, I try to go back to genotype. So I'm going in the reverse direction um, compared to what uh, I, I've been taught and I'm supposed to do. So I, I admit there is a mistake that I always make, but it works for me. Now, um, this is an example of uh, phenotypic heterogeneity on the top chart where you can see that one gene SCN1A can cause a very mild epilepsy such as genetic epilepsy with febrile seizure plus and on the extreme spectrum it can cause Dravet syndrome so just example and other genes do the same thing so this is becoming more and more complex in, in clinical situations that you have one gene that can cause different phenotypes from very mild to very severe. And, and the opposite trend is the locus heterogeneity. For example, one disorder such as epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures now can be caused by three different genes. And uh, talking about precision here that if you have epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizure, there is a gain of function mutation. So understanding the function of mutation is allowing us to use the right kind of drugs. So in KCNT1, which is a gain of function mutation causing EI MFS, tunidine may be a very useful drug and has been shown to be beneficial in some patients with this very refractory childhood disorder. Um, now, if the same condition occurs to due to a, a sodium channel mutation, there is no role of tunity. You can go to the old fashioned channel blockers such as phenytoin, carbamazepine, and trileptil, and they are quite effective, by the way, in uh, SCN2A. And you might be wondering that we have been teaching people not to use um, uh, sodium channel blockers in people with SCN1A mutation, and I will come to that. There is a reason for that. So, uh, Understanding the biology of the disease is quite important. Hopefully I've given you some idea about where we are going in the field of pediatric neurology and epilepsy with genetic information. So what this simply means, it means that you have identified a disease causing putative genes. Secondly, you have studied the function of that gene, and then you are using that information to select an appropriate therapy. That appropriate therapy could be a diet therapy. That appropriate therapy could be a medicine or, uh, and antisense oligonucleotide or something like that. But that's the concept of a precision medicine. And we have been doing precision medicine for a very, very long time. A lot of terminologies are being used for um, precision medicine, targeted treatments, disease modifying therapies, and genome guided therapies. Okay, so channelopathies is a very important group of epilepsies that um, we now understand uh, better and better. So I would like to um, share this with you, that if you have a SCN1A mutation, this is that which causes Dravet syndrome, has a loss of function mutation. And in loss of function mutation, uh, if you give them sodium channel blockage drug, it really leads to exacerbation of the disease. In contrast, if you um, look at SCN2A, these are gain of function mutations. And in these cases, you can use sodium channel blockers. So this is interesting that understanding the actual function of the gene is very helpful to select uh, already available anti-seizure medications. Now, also like to point out to you that um, uh, in SCN1 imitation, Dravet syndrome, we now have some remarkably effective drugs, steripentol, fentanyl, and cannabidiol. And I'll show you some other data that talks about some repurposed drugs in, in this field. So uh, please take a snapshot of this. I can't go into details of each one of them, just to give you a concept that gene mutation followed by functional study of the gene is quite important in deciding what therapeutic modalities you, you need to use. Okay. Sudden unexpected death. I did mention about this as a comorbidity, and this is real. Uh, many of our iron channel related epilepsies have been linked to sudden unexpected death of epilepsy. This is a kind of situation which is non traumatic. Um, 
and nobody has witnessed a seizure and many of these patients are found dead in bed. It's a horrible, horrible condition. It, uh, it's quite, um, a, I wouldn't say it's common, but it's far more common in adults than pediatric population. As pediatric neurologists, relaying this information to the parents is very, very difficult that you can tell them, look, there's a possibility that your child will never wake up. So investigators, researchers all around the world started to gather information. And what we learned is that amongst these ion channel genes, SCNA, KCNH2, which is a potassium channel gene, and KCNQ2 actually are also implicated in long QT syndrome. So these genes are not only expressing the problem in the brain, but they're expressing the problem in the heart as well, leading to sudden and unexpected death. Now, zebrafish, I would uh, request everybody to visit the National Aquarium in Abu Dhabi, where they are beautiful zebrafish. Zebrafish is an amazing um, model for studies of human diseases because it has about 85 percent homology to human diseases. It, it's amazing. Scott Baraban and colleagues in, uh, in San Francisco, they developed an um, uh, SCNA1 model of, of zebra pit, which is actually shown here. This is the wild type. This is the uh, mutant model. And what they do is they expose these um, tiny larval fish um, with different kinds of medications, so they can expose one, uh, six kinds of drugs to one fish. So there are many, many compounds, uh, and, and these are actually compounds that are available. They've been approved by FDA already, so you don't have to do any phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials to bring these drugs. All you do is you put those drugs in those dish where these fish are, and you see the response. And it's been a transformative sort of um, value in terms of epilepsy genetics, what we have learned from it. Okay, so after Scott Baraban and colleagues tried many, many different drugs for this, this model of epilepsy, they found that Clemizole, which is an approved drug, which is simply a, a antihistaminic compound, turned out to be the best compound to treat Dravet syndrome but they could not explain it by its antihistaminic mechanism. And they did some more studies and they found out that actually clemazole and the analogs like that are modulators of serotonin sig signaling. So here is a new way of actually approaching drugs by trying to model drugs, not on basis of, uh, um, of um, um, classification, but using some information from models of epilepsy to develop new compounds. And in fact, when they looked at the other drugs, uh, lorcaserin, which is actually a proof diet pill, and trazodone, we all know that it's an antidepressant, right? These are highly effective compounds in, in the uh, zebrafish model of Dravet syndrome. And I can tell you that zebrafish has become the most uh, commonly studied um, uh, animal model for epilepsy because, uh, um, you know, rodent studies are difficult and higher mammal studies are even more difficult. Now, one of the beautiful diseases that we know about is uh, tuber sclerosis. Tuber sclerosis is an amteropathy in which there is mutations in T TSC1 and TSC2 gene leading to tuber sclerosis, and there is overactivation of mTOR. And similarities between this and GATA1 complex diseases, so this is the cortical tubers that you see in patients with tuber sclerosis. This is a giant cell pandemoma, and these are due to mutations of the hematin uh, and other gene TSC1 and TSC2 mutation. A very related mTORopathy is um, data one complex diseases that lead to development of focal cortical dysplasias. Now, you can see that in both of these, uh, there are about four or five genes that affect this mTOR signaling pathway. Uh, mTOR is supposed to be like brakes that the brain needs to apply so you can stop the development of tumors, you can stop the development of giant celestroma, and it's a systemic disease with overgrowth in many other organs. So instead of treating one symptom at a time, seizure, uh, tumors, and things like that. Now you have what's called the mTOR inhibitors, which have been available for over the last six, seven years, everolimers, serolimers, demsidra, and they are highly effective options for TSC and GATA1 complex-related disorders. And they 
they, they are effective for all manifestations of the disease. So this is really transformative. So tuberous sclerosis is one disease where we have understand the underlying biological mechanism in complete detail. And now we are able to use drugs that are really targeting the un underlying biological defect. Interestingly, rapamycin, I would have forgotten this, but it is a repurposed drug. It was an antifungal drug, amazing. Nobody knew that repelogs like that would be used in epilepsy till about a few years ago. Potassium channelopathies, I will not go into details of that. So here's a list of all the precision therapies we have. I'm not gonna go into all of them. We have potassium channel blockers. We have mimentine, which is an MDA receptor antagonist and is used for patients with Alzheimer's disease. It, can also be used for patients who have uh, epileptic encephalopathy syndrome known as KCNQ2, and clemazole is in phase three trials. And importantly, we all know about this, that you need to avoid certain drugs when you see poll demutation. And uh, lots of um, speakers have talked about the use of ketogenic diet in, in, um, in certain genetic conditions. Okay, so genetic-based therapies now are moving into personalized therapies. And I already spoke to you about these repurposed sort of like, this model, animal models paved the way for trying all the repurposed drugs, which are all, uh, all approved by FDA sitting on a shelf. You can try these drugs and filter out those compounds that have anti-seizure properties. We have heard a lot about antisense oligonuclear therapies. And in fact, there is a um, gain of function animal model for SCN2A in which benefit was shown uh, for atelurin, which is used in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Gene therapies are still in the works and will come. Uh, we know the role of CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 is changing everything. Uh, no wonder the um, Jennifer, uh, I don't know the last name of the doctor and Elizabeth, um, uh, Charpentier won the Nobel Prize for this in, in 2017. So this was amazing technology that's come into research and hopefully will allow us to develop better anti-seizure medications. I will close in by talking a little bit about paranomics. This is a step forward, right? I mean, from precision therapy to you are, you are going to another level of individualized therapy. So what is paranomics? Paranomics is actually a gene company that um, it specializes in creating a model for a patient's own genetic mutation. So as a doctor, you can send the fibroblast or blood for DNA analysis. They will screen many compounds and then they will give you an answer. Okay, this is not for free, obviously they charge it. So you can see that we are moving from precision therapies and precision medicine to individualized person therapy. So if I have a patient with Dravet and I wanna know okay, what's the best drug for it? This company can do it for me. And I think more and more companies like are coming, which are going into individualized genomics. So in conclusion, precision, method, method, uh, precision medicine is not a new idea. It's a longstanding old idea. Now we are just getting uh, started by including genetics. I think whole genome is sequencing is the way to go in clinical practice. Uh, in fact, I spoke to him and he told me that when you do whole genome sequencing, you can get copy um, um, chromosomal microarray done at the same time. Um, so I will leave it uh, there for you to reach the re uh, rest of the slide here because I think my time is up. And um, as I want to acknowledge the families and parents who really on a day-to-day -day basis inspire us to do what we do. And uh, these are some of my colleagues who work with me on brain chromosome 20 on the left. These are parents, by the way. Uh, they, they, they formed the foundation, they spearheaded it, and, and they made the physicians um, uh, powerful by um, giving us the information that we needed. And I also collaborated with Spinner Lab Laboratory at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So I want to acknowledge them as well. Um, and thank you all for listening to both people who are here and who are virtual. And if anybody has any questions, my email is listed there. Thank you for your attention.